Hello, and you're very welcome to our panel discussion today for Climate Week New York. Today, we're going to be talking about sustainable fashion and asking the question, can sustainable fashion be a vehicle for positive social change? And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Shannon Welch of Fashion Revolution USA and Katie Brill of Junk Couture. And I will be your host for today, Dr. D. Duffy. Okay, let's get started and we'll start with Shannon. Shannon, I absolutely love Fashion Revolution. I came across it in my role as a lecturer and it's, I just found it an unbelievable resource like of lots of free information, like a wealth of information and reports um, all around sustainability, supply chains and fashion. So I love it. Um, so I'm I want to hear a little bit more. Maybe can you tell us how you came across the Fashion Revolution and how you got involved in it? Yeah. So it, it's hard to pinpoint exactly when I became aware of Fashion Revolution. Um, obviously, it was formed after the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory in 2013. Um, so the organization was started uh, a little after that, about a year after that. Um, so since 2013, I kind of woke up um, from the, from what's going on in the fashion industry. Um, I probably came across Fashion Revolution in different articles, of course, were very uh, prominent on social media, but I actually became um, like a member of Fashion Revolution USA about four years ago. Uh, I was doing work with um, an ethical fashion retailer here in the US and kind of just went to a Fashion Revolution um, event and from there just introduced myself to the country coordinator and she kind of took me under her wing, and since then I've been, um, you know, a, a, a member of the, of the U.S. organization, and now I lead um, partnerships here in the U.S. Um, so it's been kind of a very organic journey, but happy to be a part of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's a, it's a super initiative. Um, okay, so Shannon, that's Shannon, and Katie, Katie of Junk Couture. Could you give us a little bit of an introduction of what is Junk Couture and what's happening? in the world of Junk Couture. Of course, T. So Junk Couture is a global platform for youth creative expression. Um, and our goal is to really enrich and empower the lives of young people through creativity, but also through sustainability as we really believe at Junket Shore by empowering the creators and the change makers of tomorrow that they can generate the, the lasting positive change through self-expression and creativity and also fashion. So what Junket Shore offers to schools and to young people in second level education is a free to enter year round programme that challenges these students to create wearable fashion and would you believe out of nothing but 100% recycled materials before they're asked then to showcase their sustainable creations and the backstory so the inspiration behind them to the world in a series of digital and live finals but Dee when I talk to you and mention um, recycled materials I mean everything from plastic bottles right through to organic materials such as creating leather um, from orange peel skin we've had film reel we've had sea glass that's washed up on beaches everything goes at Junkature and really their innovation never fails to amaze us and yeah we're really excited to be launching in in New York this year that's right from its origins in Ireland to the launch in in New York this week this week so that's fantastic and I think what you're saying there, there's fabulous connections there between fashion revolution. I know I was listening to the, one of the founder, Orsola De Castro, and she had this lovely phrase of waste is a, is a massive resource. And I think there's a lovely tie in there between fashion revolution and junk couture, um, you know, of that idea of repurposing and recycling and finding new life, breathing new life. Absolutely, and it's so great to meet Shannon as well virtually because yes. I know yes. at Junk Couture we are big fans, Shannon, huge fans of Fashion Revolution. And going back to what you said there, Dee, you know, we call our students and our participants these circular engineers because mm -hmm. what they're doing is, and what we've realised over, over the past few years is that they are our future change makers, mm -hmm. our leaders, mm -hmm. and, and they have the capacity to view 
waste as raw materials for something new to give it that new life and to say you know hold on a second um instead of you know that item in my wardrobe that i no longer like to you wear or to use i'm going to cut it up i'm going to sew i'm going to thrift it i'm going to sell it on one of those secondhand apps they're getting super creative because environment the environmentalism and the youth's role in it is something that they're quite passionate about and it's wonderful to see you will absolutely, and I think one of the big messages around Climate Week New York is this idea of mobilising community groups to take action around climate change awareness. And I, I would think one demographic to do that really well are the young teenagers, young 20s, the so-called Gen Z generation. I think they have such potential to be the change makers of tomorrow. And, and I think it's critical that that voice you know, it becomes louder because it's their generation that's going to, you know, have to find solutions to the problems that that, that has created, or has been created over the last few decades or maybe centuries, <laughs> we don't know how long. Um, but look, um, Shannon, in relation to fashion choices, how do you think Gen Z can make a difference to how we think about fashion? Oh, I mean, I think they've already been making um, changes in the way that we think. I mean, that generation is digitally native. So they've grown up using the internet, using social media, um, and there's so many messages that can be spread so quickly. So it definitely kind of democratizes um, information flow. And I think Gen Z is very, very aware of that. And in terms of sustainable fashion and activism and all these different ways, they've been able to create communities outside of their, you know, um, geographic location. So I think Gen Z has definitely been to advocate, to create their own messages, to connect with other people, um, you know, globally and able to um, share these messages and get involved in different organizations such as Fashion Revolution. Um, and we know that Gen Z is definitely more woke, as, as, the, chill, as the kids say. <laughs> They're definitely woke, more woke and they've been, and they've seen climate change happen right in front of their eyes. Like as you and I are a little bit older than Gen Z, like I have seen the changes in the past 10 years, in the past five years of different, um, you know, of weather patterns that have changed very locally and how that has been different over a past decade and they have grown up knowing how different it is so it's very much in their face and I think um, they're really taking the reins and moving and moving a lot of these um, conversations and movements forward I mean if you look at like Greta Thunberg like look what she's done for climate change and and really and really putting the messaging back into the face of you know policymakers um, and, and really raising the awareness there. So I think Gen Z is definitely, I mean, all of our younger generations are the future and I think they're push, pushing us in the right direction and is any way that we can support them, we are 100% we are behind anyone that wants to, um, to make this change that is drastically needed, urgently needed. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's a great point actually about the digital natives and, you know, the reach they're able to get through social media and through technologies. It's so important, so valuable. Um, and look, Katie, as some of we might be talking about Gen Z, so somebody who's closer to the Gen Z generation, be interesting and, and very important to get your take on this. And, you know, do you see young adults making changes to their fashion consumption practices or their wardrobes? like in your experience, your peers? Yeah, absolutely. And funny enough, I actually am on the final year of Gen Z myself. Um, okay. <laughs> and then it's now I have, I'm the eldest of four girls, who have three younger sisters, their friends, even younger. Um, and then obviously all the junk couture participants I get to meet. So I'm constantly around Gen Z and, and getting to witness exactly how hyper aware this generation is about the environment um, and how best to create consciously. This age group, I suppose, if you think about it, they make up 40% of consumers and they really are showing that they're seeking more from sustainable brands and products and they're asking for more and they're telling the world that, you know, 
we take climate change seriously and they're doing that in in so many different ways and you know you, you see them now they're making trends out like thrift flipping videos they're making trends on TikTok about come vintage shopping with me they mm. are now becoming influencers who are selling on apps like depop um so it's these students that are making these trends and becoming micro influencers because if you think about it they then go into school and someone asks what is she doing or what is he doing and this is powerful and this is powerful because that catches on and it's something that I suppose it's it's very new but I believe that vintage is a trend you know we have fashion trends vintage is a tre trend and you know sustainable fashion is the trend and, and I see it with my own my own friends and young people they're now looking to build capsule wardrobes they're now asking themselves will I get multiple wears out of this because before and I know I was like younger and I used to buy a top and if you wore it once or twice you didn't think much of it but now people are becoming more educated about the you know that the fashion industry is the second largest polluter in the world that wasn't spoken about a couple of years ago I certainly wasn't educated about it in school I certainly didn't have um junk couture I was only introduced that introduced to junk couture as a late teenager um, and now you have these students that sustainable fashion and environmentalism, it becomes an inherent part of their DNA because they're learning about it from, you know, each other. Yeah. And primary yeah. school, it, it, you know, it's it constantly in the news, it's in magazines, mm -hmm. it's everywhere. So all of a sudden they're now questioning adults. Why are you not? Why are you not doing this? Where I have, mm -hmm. I had that experience as well, where I had a, a young cousin who asked a question and you know, to an, an older aunt and she said, oh, where did you buy that from? Oh, did you know that this brand is? And I went, oh, hello, who's educating who here? <laughs> um, That's brilliant. brilliant. That's Absolutely. And, and, and I like that you said DNA, that it's in their DNA because they think that's what's going to be critical rather than it being a fashion trend, that it actually becomes a way of life and embedded in our way of life, recognizing like the, the waste. So I think it's great that if you if you are seeing that that it's just a part of everyday life. Um, and I was wondering, Katie, have you made any personal changes or have you become more more of a conscious consumer? Just out of interest. Absolutely D. So my journey with sustainable fashion probably started in university. Um, um that was probably when I was 19 and I was looking at my own buying habits um, where I would go into town with my friends on a Saturday and purchase some clothes and not think about it. Um, now I look at my wardrobe and I know for a fact I'm building a capsule wardrobe where they're not trends. It's my personal style. I don't I don't personally think that following trends is is having fashion sense. Um, I think having a sense yeah. of fashion and style is personal to you and should carry you not just um, a season by week, as we know some fashion brands drop a season every week. Um, it should carry you winter to winter every year and that you pull out the same. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't look, I don't tell students and younger people that you have to buy expensive items. I just try to encourage my friends and my peers and, and myself when I am in certain stores and say, Katie, will you wear that a minimum of just say 30 times? It's simple, mm -hmm. simple mm -hmm. things like that. As a young person who, as I suppose, Dee, being on social media is quite difficult. Um, influencers with beautiful clothing, um, you're, you're trying to go to parties, you're trying to be in town, you're, you're trying to be seen amongst your peers and be accepted with the latest, greatest trends. But what's wonderful about it is it's now it's the community of young people mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. feeling this way together and you're not feeling left out by not having it. Um, so, yeah, personally, for me, it's one thing I'm doing is questioning myself and challenging myself when I do want to purchase an item um, and trying to buy far less. And um, so, yeah, that would be the main thing for me. I mean, it, I was going to say it, it's great to hear that you came to sustainable fashion at the tender age of 19, because like when I kind of was aware of it, I think I was 28 when I came to it. So there's all those years where you weren't buying fast fashion or whatnot. So even if you think that was late, I, I, I applaud you <laughs> for making that change as a teenager. Sure. Yeah, and that then, yeah. I suppose, Sean, and that comparison just it's, it's very... Uh, inspiring and exciting to know that then maybe in a couple of years time that age will be younger yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, and we just won't even have to worry about that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Brilliant, brilliant. And look, those of us, uh, you know, who've been working in the sustainability space and exploring climate change for some time, 
realize that to put sustainability and fashion in the same kind of phrase can seem a bit like a bit of an oxymoron. How can, you know, consumer fashion be sustainable? However, there has been lots of innovative new practices, sort of new kind of creative materials, alternative materials being sourced that gives a reason for kind of, you know, we've talked about maybe our consumer shifts and changes, but, you know, on the opposite side of industry changes. And uh, Shannon, I'd be really interested to hear, have you come across any innovative, maybe stories, products, brands, um, that you could share with us of, of what you see happening as someone who's got sure. their own goals? Well, instead of just like specific companies, I think um, like topics and ideas such as just like regenerative fashion. I know this this term sustainability has been kind of fought against a little much because like what are we sustaining? Are we sustaining the same production practice? And I don't like to get into the specifics about sustainability because uh, the term sustainability, but just um, to kind of take that one step further using like regenerative agriculture in, in terms of growing cotton instead of just organic, which you know, you're, you're creating more um, biodiversity or bringing biodiversity back to, um, to crops. So just in general, like that, that um, way of, of producing, I think is, it's not innovative. We did this 150 years ago, but I think that's something that definitely, yes, absolutely. And then in terms of just innovations, of course, there's all these incredible um, ways that, you know, Scientists are using mushrooms or mycelium to create, you know, lab-grown leathers or using what we would call waste of like pineapple skins or orange fiber, as I think Katie mentioned, and that's technically waste, so it would be trash and turning that into different materials. So there's like incredible work going on um, in, in terms of those sort of innovations. They're not really available yet at scale. They're still a little um, pricey, I think, for a more price conscious consumer to afford. Um, but in, in other ways, like we don't really need a ton of innovations to get us forward. I think what we have to do is do what we do better. If you look at like the supply chain, um, the area that has the largest like negative environmental impact is, you know, the spinning and the weaving and the dyeing of, of materials. And if we can work at that segment and make sure that we're, you know, reducing the water use or recycling the water that is being used there, um, eliminating hazardous chemicals so there's no disruption to the, the communities around there, um, and, this, and implementing more energy efficient machinery. So there's like, it, it's not sexy and it's not really exciting or new, but it's just like if we just focus back on these this certain area, that can definitely um, impact our impact um, moving forward. But again, I think what's really the exciting things are like the mushroom leathers and, and, and stuff like that. Um, and again, like going back to like natural dyes, like a lot of what we're looking at in the sustainable like fashion movement is kind of going back to the way things were done before, um, where we weren't taking, 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 taking. Um, we're just using and then replenishing as, as needed. Um, so just kind of going, going back um, to bring us forward, I think is also important to look at. Yeah. Yeah, and like I just to add to that, like I think you know we don't mean to demonize like the processes that have been you know become kind of normalized in the last few decades. We, that was progress in our you know in our naivety. That was progress, mm -hmm. and now we realize okay, you know our convenience, our faster methods, you know they, they're flawed. They're flawed, and then like so, let's go back and learn from as you say previous generations. And I think that could be exciting and new, and there's new opportunities there in that whole supply chain, in like how, what is fashion, how to produce fashion moving forward. And um, so, like I too would see like this possibility for for positive perspectives there on what we could do and learn from our it's recent slowing mistakes. it down. It's slow fashion. It's slowing things down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Katie, have you come across anything exciting or innovative? Yeah, do you, I suppose I'll give a personal spin and, and a junk chore spin um, to any <laughs> people that are ent any students that are entering that um, might want to know about some sustainable tools and tips. I suppose super, for super. part in junk chore. Oh, of course, yes, yeah, 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 for the production process, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it. And yeah. it was a recent conversation um, that I had with our brand designer, Sam at Junkature, and we were just looking at some designs. And when students have created a design out using recycled materials, 
sometimes it just doesn't end there and they like to add some color or some you know hand paints with acrylic paint and one thing we've noticed is some students using spray paint so your aerosols mm -hmm. and as we all know that aerosols can contribute to the depletion of ozone layers because they have they release harmful gases such as petroleum i know is one of them um, and there was recently a brand that we came across and we we're like my god this is great this is a step towards you know a better product that's not going to have this harmful effects because they use acrylic um, latex it's in their spray paint which contributes to a massive 55 percent less of that um, smog pollution than your you know your basic your traditional um, spray paint so that'd be one i would encourage students to look into if they are trying to add some color to some plastic bottles or some egg cartons or whatever they're designing with um did you make it a did you mention the brand there? Oh, or? Geez, it's Cr Krylon, so K or Y L O N S. Krylon okay. is, is the brand. Okay. Um, and they do loads of colors as well. And if it's school, Casey's top tip. <laughs> yeah, and if schools were getting, you know, buying supplies for students to to use, because of course all the materials have to be one hundred percent recycled. But some students do like to add color and paint. Then I would recommend trying to stay away from your traditional aerosols. Nice, nice. And then for yeah. myself personally, I am obsessed with a particular brand called Veya which is um, a footwear so sneaker brand and I don't know if many people know the brand in the US but um, yeah, yeah. it's Veya is Brazilian for look and I couldn't mm -hmm. believe when I found this out and it's to look beyond the sneaker itself and to look at how they're made to look at how much do the laborers get paid what chemicals mm -hmm. are being used and I only found that out you know I purchased them because I heard they were made from plastic bottles and I thought that was really cool mm -hmm. um, and then when I read into the, the the brand and on their website they have a transparency section which mm -hmm. I just got engrossed in one evening um, and just loved it because it's so in, in, in detail they have case studies there um, all down to what materials they prefer to use how the um, the shoes are dyed um, and then they did some research and they shared that research and they did a comparison as to how much the the, the trainer would cost um, in China in comparison to um, where they get where they make them in Brazil and I believe it was it would have cost three times less to produce in that Chinese factory than in the Brazilian factory in comparison to the organic cotton they were using the chemicals the, the, how much the labor has been paid and I just love that transparency and um, and then my pair my first pair was in 2019 and I still wear them today so it's not that they're making shoes that don't last which I love yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think they can thank thank uh, Meghan Markle for popularizing the Vea shoes. If she I did. remember correctly, I think she put them on the map. I think so, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, they just became a massive trend amongst young people. I was living in Edinburgh at the time and they were just everywhere. And I just thought, wow, they look amazing. Looked them up and thought, no way. I was just, mm -hmm. um, I love that about the brand. And, and really for us at Junk Couture, we're just trying to get students, it's not about you know saying that we're a sustainable brand it's about getting changing the, the mindsets of these students to just think differently at waste and to to ask more from brands as well um and really it's important that you know they don't have to go buy via sneakers we're just asking them to to look into it and to make conscious decisions okay absolutely well look probably leading into to, uh, to our final question there as um to two people who live or looking to, well, I suppose all three of us are, uh, strive to live uh, sustainable lives, I would say, or certainly do our best and do our bit. I wonder, it'd be nice to share with listeners maybe your top three tips, we might start with Shannon, of how you suggest maybe you live a more sustainable life or one could mm -hmm. live a more sustainable life. Sure. So, yeah, I think easy ways for um, citizens is what we like to call everyone who's who's active um, to participate in like sustainable fashion is look what you already own. I think you don't have to buy something to be considered like more sustainable. Um, fashion Revolution has a w wonderful campaign called Love to Close Last. So it's all about seeing what's in your wardrobe, loving what's in your wardrobe, mending what's in your wardrobe, which is something that I think has been lost over the, the generations as we don't just sew buttons back on or fi fix holes. Um, also, if you are gonna buy something new, I think as Katie mentioned before, 
are you going to wear it at least 30 times? Like take a moment to think about it. Um, don't just buy to buy, even though that kind of gives you like a little bit of um, a dopamine high. We, we understand that. Um, and, and the same sort of thing is like, does it, does it bring me joy to, to bring it back to um, Marie Kondo? Really like take a moment to think about what you're purchasing and how long you're going to have it. And if you're, if you at one point you are, um, it doesn't bring you joy anymore, swap it with someone. You can do all of these things for free. So I think that's kind of like the, my best three tips that I could give. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely really helpful. What about Katie? Do you have any final top tips? Shannon, you have nipped me to the bud with my friendships, <laughs> but I think that really emphasizes the message. You know, it's always think twice before tossing anything. Family, friends, neighbors, maybe do like a swap shop, go over to your friends, see what yep. she, she has that she doesn't want and do swap. I used to get bags from my cousin, older cousins, and I thought I was like amazing. I thought I'd just hit the jackpot. So you don't know what's trash to you is another person's treasure. So always keep that mm -hmm. in mind. The wearing something a minimum of 30 times is a big one guys think capsule mm -hmm. wardrobe think what will get you season to season um because really sustainability just means longevity try get as long out of your clothes as possible and yeah the single best thing we can all do for the planet i suppose and to reduce our fashion footprint is just to buy yes. less so absolutely yeah. and can, can i just link that there shannon uh, speaking of pre-loved you had a great story of of and um, the magic of you know when you love something it it lasts it stays with the family. Do you want to yeah, share that with you? Heirlo yeah, heirlooms. I have this um, really beautiful bracelet from my great grandmother that I think she got on like vacation in Morocco back in the 40s, 50. I'm not really sure exactly when, but like I, it is passed down from my grandmother to my mom and then she's given it to me. So it, it's, it's, it's treasuring and valuing those pieces instead of having this disposable mindset, which is what has kind of been pushed on us with like fast fashion and whatnot. Um, there's so much, so much love, as I was saying before, yeah. um, in those pieces and you do care for them and you want to make sure you take care of them so you can pass it along further. Um, but yeah, I know that bracelet, um, I've, I've been looking at it. I need to polish it because I've been wanting to wear it, but yeah, you have to, you have to take a little time and put a little TLC into some of those things, but it's totally worth it. But I, I do think like those stories, stories in a piece, like just keep it going. Like I have a handbag, my grandmother's as well, and I don't care where she bought it or, you know, what brand it is or how much it might be valued on the market now. What was important to me is imagining her back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, going around with a little handbag around the streets of Dublin City. And I love that. I love that picture. So look, um, this has been lovely to chat to everyone. And just, I, I think that's the beauty of climate change, you know, these weeks, Climate Week in New York, of this idea of getting people together and sharing anecdotes, stories, tips. And um, I really hope anybody listening today, if they take anything away from this or just get inspired, maybe to look up Fashion Revolution, which is a fantastic resource, check out Joan Couture. If we have anybody interested in exploring the competition, it's arriving in New York this week. Um, but in the meantime, thank you so much to my guests, Shannon Welch and to Katie Brill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us.